bear with me. Thanks. OK, you'll notice that there uh, that it's recording and an alert has given up and the, the recording has started. So last week we talked about what learning communities were and there was this great resource that talks about um, an opportunity for students to um, organize and plan together, work collaboratively, give and receive feedback and evaluate their own learning. And after I had given, we had gotten a kind of overview from Maggie about what Learning Services is doing, and then I gave you a feedback form. So the people who did fill it out, there wasn't a lot, but I did get some pretty good feedback from the people who did. They said, okay, but how do I do this in my class? So I wanna talk a little bit more specifically this week about how you can do this in your class and give you some opportunities to kind of play around and experiment and then we'll kind of open it up and have some conversations if possible. Um, so the framework that is really helpful when you think about online learning is, uh, is using a community of inquiry. And in particular, when you're talking about um, building this community, it's this social presence. So this is something that often gets overlooked uh, when you're designing your courses because you're so busy thinking about the content and how you're going to select it and how am I going to, what are my teaching strategies and what, how am I going to assess? And you want to think about places that you can build this social presence. And so that means like where, how are you going to set the climate? And so I think I want to stop here, um, if you don't mind, even though we're being recorded, and just kind of ask what kinds of things you do currently or in your face-to-face -face classes to ensure that you have like a, a climate. And maybe I will uh, pass it to Leanne, because I know that you do this in your grad course. Did you know I was going to do that to you, Leanne? <laughs> Sorry, I was just swallowing tea. No problem. Yeah, so what kinds of things do you do already to start creating um, uh, we'll say positive learning climate in your class. And please just jump in. And if everybody uh, jumps in at the same time, then I'll invite people. But for now. Uh, OK, so I'll go first. Uh, so I, my classes can range from as small as eight all the way up to um, the laboratory maximum size, which is usually around 25. So it really comes down to uh, the number of people. Um, if it's a smaller, int more intimate group, then usually, you know, we will go around, make sure everyone gets to know each other, why people are taking the course, uh, what are they hoping to get out of the course. Uh, that's kind of that those are you know the sort of standard icebreakers right off the bat on the the first day if it's a larger course usually we try to get them to do things in small little groups a lot of times they're going to be working in groups so it's you know go for, uh, if you want to rearrange yourselves if you found that you just realized that one of your friends uh came in from is at the other side of the lab feel free to go meet up with them talk and then make your groups that way um you know and then you know sometimes we've done things like what's the ask your your new lab partner uh, what the most recent Netflix thing is that you've been watching or something of that variant, just to, again, sort of help let, be a little less intimidating, especially some of the labs you walk in and if you're not familiar with all the equipment there, it's it, it can feel a little intimidating. That's great. Thank you, Robert. Those are great examples of, of how you can bring that into the classroom. I see some people putting in the chat. Um, so Maggie does some small group discussion on open ended interesting topic. Excellent. Um, Samantha, what kind of stand up do you do? Here's your chance. You just got to read the room, you know. <laughs> More like situational comedy. It's easier when you're in person, not so much when you can't see people. Great. That's a good example, yes. And uh, Rox talks about um, building community codes together. Excellent. And Karen talks about think, pair, share. Yes, these are all really good examples of how you can do that. And maybe and we're going to look at how we can do that in uh, in an online environment. Uh, Linda, did you have your hand up or did it? Yeah, I was just going to say like to, to build on the comedy. I tell them, um, well, I tell them I'm a double Scorpio with an Aries moon trend trined into a grand trine and fire to just try to get them laughing. <laughs> That's and good. Then we'll we'll talk about little things about me and then try to do little things about them, but mainly try to get some humor. I mean, I teach tax, right? Like this is not funny. <laughs> Oh, no, that's true. <laughs> I just giggled nervously. Yeah, I know. <laughs> that's good. OK, um, and so and I want to build on on uh, what Rox was saying about community ground rules. So here's like a wall of text that I just want to show you like an example. And it's from this humanizing online learning where you can do this. Um, you can set these out beforehand, but actually ground rules are most effective or, um, you know, ways of being if you do it together. 
Um, and so I want us to, to exercise and practice. So if you click on that link, it will take us to an etherpad where we can actually talk about our ground rules. Let's say if we were a classroom, what were what would be our expectations in this class of, of participation? How would we, what are our ways of being together? Um, and so I'm gonna ask you to actually click on the link. Um, and as you go in, you'll notice that each person gets a different color. Um, and you can start adding some of your ideas there. Yep. And for the recording, I'm not going to show this on the recording, but um, there's some beautiful colors. Uh, people are talking about respect sharing, giving space for people to respond. And so we're doing this as a synchronous activity over this period of time, but you could actually do this over a longer period of time and it could be built in as something that you do in the first week as a kind of uh, um, community building activity. We could say, you know, these are these are my expectations, but um, what what are your expectations so that students feel um, like they're part of the building? Things like civility, openness to new ideas. These are great. There's some really good questions that have put been put into um, into this that would be really excellent guiding documents about creating these uh, ways of being. Things like what makes a community? Like how do we know that we're part of a community? And what do you offer to our learning community? And what does being a member of this community look like and mean to you? So asking students to kind of um, contribute and think about and uh, provide their perspective as you build this community together can give these chances for your classroom to be this space where you're fostering the social connection um, where hopefully it's a safer space for you to explore all of the content. Okay, I'm going to bring you back into Teams if you can. Uh, Lindsay has a great question about Etherpad, and I am going to do a little bit of a, a meta jump out. So um, Etherpad is something that's um, it's it's technically an external tool, but it's hosted on site at Brock. So that means that all of the data and information is handled pr privately at Brock. So we're not pr giving it anywhere else. It's hosted locally. It you don't need to log in at all. It knows who you are based on. Um, I kept it open, but if you had gone in through the Sakai site, it would know who you are based on uh, your login that way. And Lindsay's asking about, um, can I see who the participants are? So uh, just if you go over to the top right, you'll see that it, um, everybody had put their name, whatever they did to get into the site and their color associated with it. And then as an instructor, I have the ability to see who all the authors are and there's a timeline so I could watch that etherpad get built up. So this can also be used for many different purposes throughout the term, um, not just a kind of a ground rules. And uh, if you've been in any of our other sessions, you've seen how we've used it for brainstorming or planning or uh, group work. It can be used lots of different ways. Um, and so I've actually, this etherpad 
that we're using right now lives in the Sakai site that I've added all of you to. So you can see it um, from a student perspective inside the Sakai site, but don't go there yet. We're gonna stay together for a little bit longer. Um, so I wanted to point out um, this uh, resource from Michelle Bukanski Brock uh, talking about the humanizing practices. And I think this is the key thing when we're talking about building community is that we want to make sure that we're not robots and we're bringing uh, our real selves to, to the class. And so there's some key points that she brings here. But the one that I wanted to talk about is um, uh, identifying your high opportunity students. So she talks about um, learn, uh, your classroom kind of as a garden. And there's some uh, plants or, st or students in your uh, class that will just do be so successful no matter what. But there's some that need a little bit more care and attention. So making sure that you can identify who those are and providing a little bit additional supports and possibly creating the community so that the community is supporting everybody so that it's not just you uh, providing supports to the students, but you're actually creating a community that can support each other. Um, she talks about um, this, this presence aspect um, empathy and awareness. And the key thing I wanted to point out today is about this um, to know your students, your ability to kind of find out where they are so that you can um, you can guide and, and foster that community all the way through. In particular, um, there's this, this tool that it, many of you have seen I'm using a lot is Office Forms, where you can kind of create this like intro survey and get a little bit of feedback right from the outset about how, where students are. Um, but also not just you knowing how they are, but for them to know how they're doing themselves. So there's this um, online readiness. I have one that if you're interested that you can also bring into Sakai, um, but this one is just sort of like a self-assessment that students can do to be like, am I ready to learn online? And what we've done in the past is we've used this to kind of build um, the, 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 pr the preliminary discussion on, okay, so what did you find out? Did did you find that you're maybe not quite ready? And what are your um, what are you going to do to try and mitigate some of the issues that you might have happen? And how can I help you with some of those issues? Or how can we as a community foster um, support that way? So these all these tools are available, um, or do you have them or not? Is something that you can check. Um, another way that we could foster community, and a lot of you have seen this as well, and I've turned this on in the Sakai site, is using student pages. So this is my get to know you that I did in uh, my uh, master's course back uh, in 2018, where I said, you know, this is hi, this is me. And then we had a little bit of engagement talking about it. And um, for those of you in the grad course, you've already added your page. And if you wanted to see what this looked like from a student perspective, um, in this building community, you can also use student pages. So I welcome you to, to go and check that out and play around there as well. Um, and that, the other key component of that building community is that piece around supporting discourse. Um, and so here's an example of uh, a really large class that is broken out into seminars. And the key question here is asked, um, you know, how do you plan to organize your time and achieve success in this course? And that's kind of like the intro thing. So that can be building upon, you know, you've done this online assessment to make sure you're ready. Now, what are you going to do and how are you going to approach this? And so the forums can be a great place that you can support this discourse. Um, and here's a picture of what I've created in our uh, learning community site where we can have a social spot. So it's sort of like our, our water cooler. We, the recommendation always is to have sort of an off topic place for people to post something that has really nothing to do with the course content, but a place for people to connect and go in. You don't have to closely monitor it, but it's a nice place for you to kind of go and make sure that people are um, connecting. In my course, I have a social spot and they're sharing tools that they they found out in the web and they're like, oh, this is a cool thing. Have you seen this? And it's um, and they're just sort of connecting on their own. You always want to remind students that they are adhering to the code of conduct uh, whenever they're in an online platform, and we'll talk a little bit about that after. And then you have like a place for them to actually ask their questions and if they have issues, and then you can have a place for this welcome and introductions. So um, the um, Sarah, you're asking about if this works similar to chat. Are you talking about the forums in particular? So the forums are um, are a threaded discussion that can happen over a longer period. You don't have to do it. Um, a chat is sort of like we're all here at one time, um, as opposed. Uh, although it does um, it does keep it um, 
um, a history of a thousand most recent chat items. So the chat does tend to, but it's very linear and it's only in one line. Whereas the uh, discussion forum, the social spot is, um, is, is similar to chat, except that it's threaded. So if I post something and I say, hey, I found this cool thing, um, you could reply to me and be like, oh, that's neat, I tried that, but I like this better, blah, blah, blah. And then somebody else who posts something totally different, like, hey, here's a picture of my dog, isn't he hilarious? Um, so it can be just, it can be all, all of those things. Um, this is uh, something that I've shared with the um, A to Z uh, Learning Services, and so, setting expectations for how we're going to be together is really important and so this is something that's released on creative commons i had a typo so i fixed it it's not fixed here but you'll it's i basically gave attribution to the wrong person sorry uh, julie finnegan um but setting up expectations of how we're going to connect and how we're going to use these uh tools right from the outset can be really important so in addition to co-constructing your ground rules and how you're going to be you also if you have some very clear things that you know and expect then it'd be great to set that um, right from the beginning and so these tools are all there and it will post that online um i feel like building community is an essential uh, uh, the teaching assistance will be essential here. Maybe I'll ask Leanne to talk a little bit about this, but we do have these great sessions coming up all through the summer for teaching assistance. And if you as an instructor are really interested in um, participating, they're asynchronous, uh, you're welcome to join us. Right, Leanne? <laughs> yes, definitely. Please do join us. Um, and I think that in terms of your own familiarity with using Sakai. If you have teaching assistants or you know one, they often have had exposure to lots of the tools and have used them in different ways. So I think they're really a wonderful help. And often, um, I think in terms of building community, they're really key. So I think um, having discussions with people who are supporting your work um, and the kinds of climate that you're hoping to build and the importance of climate for learning um, is really important. Um, and as always, if you ever want any help with any of those things, we've got lots of people over in Sakai who would love to um, support and have those discussions with you. Thanks, Leanne. And uh, Rox, you make up a great point. Do you want to come say that out loud or I can read your comment if you prefer, but I'd love to hear you say it. Yeah, sure. I think um, some of the conversations that we're having uh, with students and and professional staff is that people are, are having barriers with technology, whether that's uh, access to reliable internet uh, and additionally equity issues related to technology. So I can give an example. Um, when a lot of us were talking about orientation, we're all coming from our different perspectives. And uh, Sandra Wong from Aboriginal Student Services had mentioned one of the top priorities that we're, we're thinking about now is how are students going to access the internet to be able to be successful in classes. So we're looking at equity issues across the board um, that I just described. So I think that if you're creating that warm, welcoming environment that was described off the top and things that we brainstorm, students are more likely to to talk to you and share about some of the challenges that they be, may be having. Maybe they only share one computer that's in their living room and five people have to use it. Um, these are these are real realities. And so I think that um, setting up the space for for people to do that. It could be even a form, um, you know, a get to know you form at the beginning that says, you know, tell me everything about you that you want me to know that's gonna, um, you know, be a limit to your success or that makes you really, and that makes you really excited to be here and what you're bringing to our class. Thanks, Rox. That's such a great point. Um, we try and reinforce that, but it's um, it's good to know and hear um, from the, the source that you're hearing this as well uh, about students having these access issues. So this is where we always, try and um, ask that you build in flexibility, especially in this time right now where there is so many barriers, um, whether it's you know social isolation and the, 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 the current situation where that people find themselves in their homes. Samantha? Sorry, I had to find my unmute button. Um, I just wanted to build a little bit on rocks um, and some of the things that we've learned in these sessions so far about rethinking a, what the contact hour looks like, but also what the entire kind of goal of the course is. And I think that if we rethink what learning looks like, 
um, we may be able to find it a little bit easier to loosen up on maybe some of the things that we've built into pedagogy, like, sorry, my daughter's in the background. That's okay. I It's making the point. <laughs> yeah, she needs to be Um I think that it's important to have that flexibility, but also realize that you can get the learning outcomes out of the course without some of the rigidity of it. So um, flexible due dates or alternate formats, this kind of universal design for learning built into this um, allows you to get the same point across in the time that we have with students rather than um, considering it in a more kind of traditional classroom setting. And I think that then allows for um, some of these uh, equity issues to be worked out through um, this kind of flexibility understanding while still approaching the learning outcomes in the same way. Great. Thank you so much. It's such a great point. I like to hear other people say it as well. Um, Donna asked a great question about uh, where you can find these student pages. Um, I'm sorry, I, I keep, um, I've done so many sessions that I forget where I put the instructions, but luckily our colleagues uh, like Leanne and Natalie have uh, designed a little video that shows you instructions from the uh, instructor perspective and how you can uh, give instructions to students from a student perspective. And I put that in the Sakai site and I can share that with you right now because that's uh, basically what I wanted us to do next was kind of jump over uh, to the Sakai site and uh, take a look around there. So um, let me share my screen. So I'm going to uh, click share screen and I'm going to share my desktop. Are you seeing that now? Hopefully. So here are the forums. Here's using student pages. So um, everybody who's been added to the course has the opportunity to create their own page. And then uh, the under resources, it has instructions on how you can add this to yourself to yourself to your own site but basically it is a it's a content within lessons so it's called student content so you're basically just adding student content to anywhere that you have a lessons page um, the way that it's set up in this site in particular is under um, it's its own lesson right here um, and so it has a, a bit of a preamble and then there's the student pages so you can go in there and play around with how that looks um, if I wanted to create my own page it's really quite simple but there are instructions that are here if, there, if you wanted a video and Natalie's done a great job of kind of explaining what that looks like. So I'm going to pop back here to you. Stop sharing. Look in my chat. <laughs> I'm glad this that small child got her snack. It was very good. Um, and Rox, do you want to before you have to go say that, so I'm not just reading your comment. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to clarify that I did mention a specific department and, and community, but that doesn't preclude any other folks having uh, access issues and not making an assumption that everyone in that community that I identified would have that issue either. So I just wanted to um, make that clear as well. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I do have to head out, but I, I guess I'll just um, leave on the note to say that um, on the student engagement side, we are looking at a program where students will be in an engagement community. They'll have a peer mentor and we're going to have similar challenges in the virtual context. So we'll pre I, I've talked to Leanne already, um, but looking to, to create some sort of toolkit and space where um, folks can go to learn how to build community, whether it's a, an academic learning community or an engagement community that focuses on a different interest area or common goals. Um, and so knowing that these two things will coexist, there's opportunities to ask, you know, uh, uh, an instructor can ask, oh, have you already done your community code in your engagement community this week or vice versa? And so we know that these things are coexisting and I, that might sound a little vague, but I'm happy to chat with with folks uh, a lot more that knowing that we're all in this together and what's going to get us through this upcoming fall term is collaboration and, and clear communication and supporting students in this virtual environment. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you coming today and, and sharing about that. I, I look forward to hearing more. Um, I'm going to be sending out a form for people to give feedback. So maybe we could set something up where you could uh, tell this group about how what that's shaping up as it shapes up um, to be. Sure, that sounds great. Okay. All right. All right. Thanks, Thanks, Rox. I know you have day. to go. Okay, I'm take gonna, care. Bye-bye. Yeah, thank you. I'm going to stop the recording and then I'm going to kind of uh, bring it back to uh, 